the potential reward is decades in the future. Have you outlived your welcome? Based on this quitting framework, you should quit your job if... Hello, welcome to the Crossover Connections with Jack Wayne podcast. We talked about the business of science in the last episode, the highest of highs in the field of science, winning a Nobel Prize for chemistry, medicine, and physics. And today we're going to be talking about the lowest of the lows. How do you know if you've hit rock bottom in your career and how do you move on and quit gracefully without burning bridges, but instead building bridges? And one of the most informative sources comes from the host of A Diary of a CEO, hosted by Stephen Bartlett. And a few years ago, he published a book in which he outlined what he calls Stephen Bartlett's Quitting Framework. And today we're going to go through this quitting framework and look at it through the lens of a scientist who's worked in a number of scientific workplaces. I'm a microbiologist, college professor, along with being a YouTuber and podcaster. So hopefully my perspective would shed light on how scientific workplaces and scientific careers can be transposed onto this kind of framework. Are you thinking about quitting? And if the answer is yes, the question then becomes, why are you thinking about quitting? It could go one of two ways. It's either the thing that you're doing is very hard or the thing that you're doing sucks. If the job that you're doing is too hard, is the challenge worth the potential reward? If the challenge of the problem is worth the reward, then of course you keep going. But if you don't feel like that reward or potential reward is worth overcoming the challenge, then you should quit. This branch of the decision tree on whether or not to quit is very dicey for scientists because in the last episode, all of the Nobel Prize laureates and winners without question, without exclusion, their discoveries happened 30 years before they were awarded the Nobel Prize. The follow-on applications from their work weren't even done by them. They were done by other scientists. The potential reward is decades in the future. So in the moment, if you're in a bad workplace, it's very difficult to see the lure of a potential reward as a reason for staying. If the challenge of a scientific workplace solving a problem, trying to drive innovation in a way that no one in the world has ever done before, if you don't see that intellectual puzzle as being worthwhile on its own, and you're looking for some other intangible outcome, reward, Award, whether it be monetary or recognition, that is not going to come in the short term. Does that mean every scientist should quit? That's not what I'm saying. You need to give yourself a looser definition and a broader definition of what a reward counts as in science. It won't be monetary in all likelihood. It will probably have to be personal and intellectual satisfaction. And hopefully you're working in an environment where your peers and your supervisor and your boss are very supportive. And that team mentality that fosters networking and collaboration, that should be the reward that propels you forward. And the process of solving puzzles is actually the biggest reward that we get as scientists. Many scientists could through their intellect and talent alone, find a very lucrative career in other areas like finance or business, but they have chosen some area of innovation where no one has broken through before. So the rewards that we're looking for often are not money. It would be nice if there was money and a lot more of it, but often we're looking for some itch to scratch, some intellectual puzzle to unlock that we think we have the answer to. And that is the potential reward that will always be there. For me, certainly the challenge of solving intellectual curiosities on a daily basis definitely is worth the potential reward. And for that reason, I, I haven't quit yet as a scientist, although you never know. The next branch of why are you thinking about quitting in this quitting framework is, hey, the process just sucks, right? The experience of working in this environment just sucks. And then there's two more decisions from here. It's, do you believe that you have the knowledge to make the process not suck? Is the effort worth going that extra step to make it not suck? Do you have the ability to improve your circumstances? And if you do have the ability, is it worth your time and effort? And in this case, if you answered no in either of these questions, either no, you don't believe you could make it not suck, then you should quit. Is the effort to make it not suck worth your time and resources. If the answer to that is no, then you should quit as well. Why does science suck? Because it is defined by failure. Out of all the sports, it is the closest parallel to baseball. If you have a hitting percentage of close to 30%, you're considered to be a world-renowned home run hitter, a maestro in this field. The sad thing is scientists have a hit rate even lower than that. I think conservatively, one out of every 10 experiments probably works. If you're not emotionally adaptable to accept the reality of how infrequently experiments work out, then you are not able to cope with the suckiness 
of science to make it sound highly technical, of course. So then it becomes incumbent upon the mentor, the supervisor or the boss, infuse your research and scientific environment with that understanding. It's about managing expectations. As a supervisor, you need to go in and say, look, nine out of 10 times, everything you do will fail. But it's my job to make sure you understand how to learn the most you can from those nine failures so that when you do get the one true success that comes along, the one experiment that works, you know how to interpret the right signals and you don't lose that result amongst all of the other noise. That's my job. You could argue it's also the job of the supervisor to maybe provide some level of emotional support, some type of camaraderie, building a team environment, any individual researcher so that it feels collaborative, that any single failure doesn't feel like it's one person's specific fault. And it's a big responsibility. It's not a small thing. Is the effort it would take to make it not suck worth it? The reward again has to be that intellectual curiosity, has to be the ability to face new problems. I do know many scientists who have decided to quit science, but stayed in science long enough to extract all the most valuable skills from the whole process. And whatever they've gone on to business, law, consultancy, they are much more effective at those roles than people without a scientific training because they are able to adapt and respond to signals from the experiments they're conducting within a new context and to make the right decision going forward. So I think the quitting framework implies that we should be quitting more frequently than we are traditionally led to believe we should. In science, the timeline for accepting what counts as failure has to be longer because again, nine out of 10 things you do in science conservatively will fail. The previous episode talks about all the Nobel laureates and all the 10, 20, 30 years that had to wait until they're research was recognized. Nobel Prize winner for medicine, Catalin Carrico was actually demoted instead of promoted four times. And all of them talk about the resiliency they had to forge on their way to making a discovery that would change the course of their field. So within our field, quitting is not so simple to read the signs because we probably don't have the leverage to be able to make the process not suck by ourselves. And there's a lot of effort involved in overcoming any kind of suckiness or any kind of challenge. And the rewards are largely internal. They're not external or extrinsic, all of these things need to be given a longer runway. Maybe not 10, 20, 30 years, but you do have to be at peace with all of these variables. The average number of careers most people have in this day and age is three to five. I'm not talking about three to five jobs. I'm talking about three to five completely different careers doing completely different things. If you quit, you should try to form new bridges rather than to burn them. And the best way of doing that is to make sure you've got a tangible outcome before you quit. That outcome can be something very concrete, like a publication, presentation at some public venue, a reference from someone in the lab, someone in your research environment, something tangible that you leave with. Try and leave in a relative position of strength rather than leave feeling like it was a complete waste of your time, a complete bust, and you aren't able to explain at your next job exactly why you left the current job that you're holding and thinking about quitting.